So here's the problem. <clears throat> the primary goal, if there is one, in all of this spiritual practice is to dismantle or rise above or destroy, if you will, the ego mind. And of course, <clears throat> the real issue is that you are using the ego to do that. And the ego cleverly pretends to be assisting you in this process. But it really, more than anything else, wants to survive. Wants to prevail. Wants to run the show. And it will do everything in its power to see that it stays in control. Including <clears throat> deceiving you, blindsiding you, pretending to be gone. Um, it will do everything it can think of because it's unbelievably smart because basically you have given it phenomenal power from the early days of your existence in this world. Let me tell you, first of all, the ego is not the enemy. <clears throat> it's not a bad guy. It's, has, it has a job to do. It's had a job to do from day one, and it's doing it. Its primary job is to function effectively in the world, to protect the you that it thinks you are, to keep you in a state of as much pleasure as possible, and to avoid as much as you can the pain of existence. And mostly it fails us. It fails us because it creates a sense of permanence in an impermanent world. It defines us as separate from everybody else and everything else, which is basically an illusion. It gives us a sense of purpose and meaning And it creates an identity that we hunger to hold on to more than anything. The whole, <clears throat> the whole of our practice is to <clears throat> slowly, methodically, carefully, let go of the ego. And it really starts at the center of Rudy's teaching of a process of 10 seconds in the middle of a breath that you were holding, not thinking, not driving the ego forward, finding a place of stillness, and essentially in a very quiet and very real part of your brain, asking for help to let go of the ego. Help to surrender is the way Rudy put it. Put it. Please help me to surrender. If you can get to a deep enough space in yourself by doing that simple practice and finding a way to go deeper and deeper in it, there is a place that supersedes ego mind. It is a field of being out of which ego arises. If you can suspend ego mind long enough, you can actually begin
to touch this core reality of who you are and allow it to reveal itself to you as more fundamental, more essential, and more real than this impermanent ego structure that wants you to think it's all there is. The whole idea of meditation, whatever meditation you do, whether it's our practice, which is rather rigorous, if you will, and vigorous and directed, or a simple meditation of mindfulness or just trying to get quiet and let go, whatever meditation form you find, the goal really is to drop into a place of knowing and a place of higher consciousness, if you will, or deeper consciousness that enfolds the ego and ultimately comforts the ego and allows it slowly to let itself go. Rudy said very clearly to me at the beginning, he said, it's a lifelong practice. Essentially that it takes a lifetime to do this. And I can only speak from experience now that I have been close to 50 years into this practice, that it has been a lifetime of work. That in order to let go of the ego, which is not really possible, but in order to go on the journey of letting go of the ego, I first of all had to have an ego that you might say was healthy. It's really hard to let go of an unhealthy ego, especially one of those egos that beats you up all the time, that somehow finds a way to push every one of your buttons and make you continually unhappy because for some people that's the only way they can live. A lot of people need to be driven by a sense of, of despair or unhappiness or um, not good enough, I couldn't, why not me, why couldn't I have what they have, guilt, anger, uh, jealousy, envy, all of that stuff is the stuff of ego. And for some people that is kind of how they function in the world. The healthier ego goes, um, I am an imperfect being, but a good being, I try hard, I have love in my life, I work, I, I serve, I am here to be part of something bigger. That's, a, that's an ego that when you get to it is actually like what you'd almost call a spiritual construct. A really, a really developed ego knows that it's part of a whole. And that whole is family, society, culture, country, whatever it is that you start to identify with, and it starts to feel somewhat comfortable in its fullness. A good ego is a launching pad. It's a real launching pad to something transcendent. The problem is that a healthy ego is no more willing to let go of itself than an unhealthy ego. They're both traps. And if you are caught in a healthy ego, you will experience this really uncomfortable feeling that whatever you have achieved is all going to get taken away. And it's very hard to invest in the comfort of that ego when you start to see it beginning to uh, disintegrate. And I will tell you, once I pass the age of 70, it's really visible. You can really see the ego is not holding itself together. It takes more glue, more time, more effort. It gets really kind of confused. It doesn't know quite what it's doing anymore. Its memory is like, whoa. <laughs> You know, I mean, the simplest things, you know, don't come back to you. It's a natural process, but the ego does start to dismantle itself. If you've been in a spiritual practice, in a meditative practice, basically what you have done 
incrementally is let go of little pieces of your ego mind and start to create cracks in the foundation. You start to take pieces of you that are really not functional and realizing that they are in a way detrimental to your happy ego and you start to really let them go. You start to know I'm not a piece of shit, I'm not a terrible person, I'm not the person that my fourth grade teacher told me, I'm not, whatever it is, you start to let it go and you start to feel lighter and lighter and lighter. Rudy told me when I was very early in the game that he was reparenting me and I thought I had good parents and I did but there was a deeper unconditional parenting a love of a love of me that Rudy provided that my parents didn't my mother she did love me enormously but she didn't like it when I started putting on weight I know that when I was a uh, eight years old I started getting blubbery and she she would she was really unhappy about that I didn't I wasn't the person who who basically reflected how she wanted me to f reflect on her in the world and I could feel the pain I was causing her it was terrible you know my dad didn't know what to do with me quite you know I mean I didn't want to go into building and construction and all the stuff he did I found that totally alien to me and and I could feel that their love for me was if I fit into certain parameters and so I worked very hard to fit into those parameters for a lot of reasons one of them was that I, that I liked being loved I really liked it I, and I also felt unbelievably safe when my parents loved me and so we do that but there are very few parents who love us unconditionally who love us as we are as opposed to how they would like us to be and so we start shifting and shaping ourselves into this person that we become that is in a sense not us it's their construct of us that we have taken responsibility for and owned and ultimately we have to be the ones to go no that's not who I am and sometimes that takes an enormously rebellious aspect that destroys all of the connectivity you have with your family parents friends or whatever people who identified you and you go off on your own way but that's a that reactive aspect is another ego reacting against the, that is still you and then you define yourself as that and how do you how do you eradicate that part of the self we're always in a game of building a new self really the spiritual journey is the opposite of that it's dismantling that self and seeing this underlying reality which is the part Rudy saw in me by unconditionally loving me that was just free of so many of these horrible constraints or what I call burdens of self and those burdens are the things you lay down lay down your burden give it to me says the Lord let me give this stuff over let it go very hard to do it's hard to do but when they start to get really weighty and you can't function if you can avoid taking a drug to not think about it if you can really say please help me you can actually lift one of these things off and just drop it away and drop another one away and you know how you know them you feel them when you sit you will feel the uh, ah, uh, tightness the discomfort the I don't like this part of me this thing that's not functioning well you'll feel it and if you stop being afraid of it and hiding from it and doing everything you can to avoid it if you can go right to it and sit in the space of your discomfort of the of the uncomfortable ego something really happens which is being with it like having a new parent having someone hug you in spite of your stuff and just embrace that thing in you that's really something you do not wish to carry around anymore it lightens up it lightens up and it falls away and you start to get two ounces lighter than you were before and you are now in the process of becoming enlightened day by day week by week month by month year by year decade by decade you find yourself becoming free unburdened you find yourself becoming in a funny way you
the you you always kind of knew was there. It's the you that is there before the ego mind has given you a, this is who I am. Because this is not who you are. This is a temporary manifestation of a you that was needed to be born into the world, to function in the world, to become part of the building process of creating the universe or creating the planetary space or the cities or the, the world, keeping the world going forward. You know, it created you, the farmer, you, the filmmaker, you, the teacher, you, the nurse, you, whatever it is, it created you to be part of the whole. And it needed this construct of ego mind to begin to do that. This is what I like, this is what I don't like, this is who I am, this is who I wish I was. All of that stuff starts to function in the world. You needed it. But imagine who you can be if you can let go of those needs and just be this vast creative force that arises to and is responsive to the moment. It's an extraordinary thing to arrive at the real you. The real you, the unencumbered, unburdened, enlightened, awakened you. The problem is the ego will not get you there. And even letting go of little pieces of the ego along the way or even big chunks of ego, as long as there's even an eyedropper full of ego, that ego is going to find a way to pull you back into its safe, safety zone. Not for your sake, for its sake. Because the ego is programmed to be terrified of not existing. It's programmed for your safety. It's programmed to guide you through all of this and not let you disappear. And it will fight to the very last second and the last breath. You will be caught up in this dynamic until you're not. My guess is, for most people, the enormous drama of letting go of ego is called death. And the death experience, for most people, is a lifetime of struggle in a matter of seconds, or minutes, or whatever you want, whatever you want to imagine it. If, in fact, there's no such thing as time, when you come to the end of your time, you enter into the timeless, and you're still there. And that's where the ego disintegrates. That's the space that you have to go through the journey that we're trying to go through now in a matter of timeless time. It has to get disintegrated in order to return to what it is and what it has always been, the creative singularity out of which we emerge. So there's a, an advantage, if you will, to trying to do this while you're here. And that's why you have all come to a spiritual practice. Because spiritual practice is somehow the ego's choice to begin this process before it gets done to you. And you can start to do this gently, day by day, and there is an advantage. And that is, you start to walk more lightly in your own shoes. You start to experience a kind of underlying comfort, joy, bliss, gratitude amazement, momentary glimpses, but enough to know this is the right path, this is the road to be on. And so it keeps you going, but it will not get you there, it cannot get you there, because the ego itself is the very thing that keeps you from being there. The ego is the filter through which you look at the universe, and it is the essence of your dualistic nature. The, the idea of a me and an it. There is me trying to get there, and then there's there. And as long as there's a me trying to get there, you are in a place of what Buddha called suffering. And you're suffering because you are separate from yourself. Separate. And so when, what do you do? How do I get there? I've meditated for 50 years, or whatever it is, and I'm still not there. I'm still feeling fear and separate and issues and stuff is still going on and all the body's falling apart and my mind is going and all that stuff. What do you do? I can't exactly tell you what one does. I can tell you what I did. And I've already told you this, but I will tell you again. I gave up. I just said, I can't do it. It's not working. I sat for 45 years and it didn't happen. I just said, 
this isn't working. All these years of meditation, I mean, I knew it had been helpful. I knew that I had had a wonderful life. I knew that by letting go of so many of my dramas and tensions and all these dis disturbances that are part of the human condition, I was able to have a long and lively and wonderful marriage. I was able to give birth to children that I really love. I was able to be around to witness grandchildren. I was able to have a career that functioned. I was able to do all of these things that gave me what people would call a full life. And I became what Rudy called a whole person. In becoming that and having that, I arrived at a place where I guess, I guess, the universe found me available and, and formed enough that it wanted to truly use me. And when I gave up, the ego mind didn't know what to do, and suddenly it went away. I was available and ready, and that took place. What took place was the realization that I had never been separate, that I had never been two, that there is only one. And it wasn't like the ego was completely dismantled because there really are always, as long as you have a biological self, there's always a con construct here. But what happens is you see the bigger picture, which is so big, so vast, so illuminated, so amazing, that your little speck in it no longer becomes central to anything. It no longer becomes the reason to be. You discover you're the totality. You're the whole thing. Why should you be living this life of suffering in this little tiny body-mind construct when you are everything there is? And that's not an ego understanding. It's not like, oh my God, I'm everything. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. It's like, oh my God period. It's like eyes open wide. It's like, I, I use this a lot, wow. And then there's no anyone to understand it. There is no one there to get it. No one. That little ego thing that still remains knows that it has absolutely no capacity for this. And it just lets go, it just kind of thy will be done, and you realize that thy will is the will that you are. This vast, unknowable, unknown, beautiful, terrifying, real, unreal, unfathomable, knowable being that you are. And week after week I sit here and talk about this. And I guess what I'm trying to do is to encourage your ego mind to really work the process, to really work this letting go process. One of the worst things about ego mind is how lost it can get in itself, how lost it can get in the world around us. You know, I always talk in the introductory class about this idea of a train of thought carrying you to like Siberia. And then there you are, off in Siberia, and often for a lifetime. You just, your train of thought took you off to this horrible place of, of isolation and, and, and cold and misery, and you're just there. How do you get back from that? How do you get back to here? Well, the only process I know is this process that Rudy taught me, which is breathe what, myself back into my heart chakra, and ask inside for help to surrender, to let go of the noise that wants to journey off into the nether worlds that are part of my own strange psyche. And to find this place inside that actually responds. You know, the, this AA process of knowing, one, that you're helpless and asking for help. This is, there's something so beautiful about recognizing that you can't do it on your own, that there is a power greater than you. But the thing they don't tell you in AA, but the, and I talk about that because I have good friends who are in it, and, but, I, but the value of it is, is that you recognize a power higher than you, and then the amazing awareness that comes is that you are that power. That is who you are.
that there is a, it's all one thing. And arriving at that is the work we're doing. This double breath, asking and trying and effort seems to be essential because so many of us are so ill-formed, so incomplete, so unstructured, our lives are so out of control, our minds are gone into problem areas. Bring it back. Bring it back here. Ask inside for help to surrender. And let something happen. Trust something bigger than you. It's there. It, I can tell you it's you, but what does that matter? Ask inside for this thing to come through and open you up and release you from the burden of you. That's the ride, and we're all on it. Everyone in this room is on it to one degree or another. Some of you more successful, some of you less successful at this moment in time. Real success is just determination. Determination comes from will and desire and need. You know, wanting, wishing, the gut level need comes from that. It comes from conscious awareness that life is impermanent and you are going to be, you're going to be gone at some point and you've got stuff to do here. Mm -hmm. It can also come from life beating you over the head. And it will do that. It does it to you. And it does it to you not out of this anger or, or, or distrust or, or, or a desire to punish you. It does it because it's got to wake you up. And how many times do you need to get hit over the head before you wake up? How many times do you need to have that happen? Well, honestly, you can probably all answer that. Multiple, multiple times. Until, until you're really in trouble. Because if you don't pay attention and you cease to pay attention every time it throws this stuff at you, if it just makes you a victim or an angry person or a why me God, you're going to lose it. The only response to deep suffering is, help me please, help me. And then the help that arises is the help that has always been there. It's not something new to you, it's not something that comes out of the ether, it's always been there. It's at the core of you. You are these deep wells that only go down an inch in your daily life. Go deep, go down, pull that nourishment up. Let it arise from within you. Let it serve you. It's there. It's there. You know, most of us are very imbalanced. There's an inner and an outer. Those who are living their life totally in the outer will always be lost and confused in a world of impermanence. Those who are completely in the inner won't take advantage of the enormity of possibility and lessons that exist in the outer. It's balance. It's the razor's edge. It's the fine line. Walking that line and then letting that line expand to include everything. Rudy's teaching was inner and <coughs> outer. Inner and outer as a whole. I love that. And it's proven to be, in the awakened state, the truth of our existence. We are inner and outer. All of us. Every one of us. And if you're living somewhere too much on one side than the other, you're going to be out of balance. Find the balance. Open. Again, if you ask for help to surrender... <clears throat> balance occurs, equilibrium, a profound equilibrium, a sense of this is who I am, this is what is. <coughs> you won't necessarily know what it is, but you'll know that it is, and you know who you are. It's, it's an extraordinary ride. Not a lot of people are on it. I think more and more are coming to it because our culture and our world is becoming so destabilized and so uncomfortable and so full of confusion that a lot of people are looking for some answer. But you guys are here. Here's the answer. Sit down. Ask for help to surrender. Open your heart. Open your mind. Open your throat chakra. Open your centers. You know, Be available. Work it. Don't be casual with it. This is not a once a week Sunday morning effort that will work for you any more than going to the gym once a, once a week or once a month will do anything for you. This is a practice. You do it until you realize in the deepest part of your psyche that it doesn't work. And then you really let go. Then you say, I give up, and that's true surrender. What is comes through. So that's the ride we're on. Your ego can only take you so far. You know, Dante, when he, 
uh, was led by Beatrice into the, the deepest heavens, the greatest heavens, got to a place where Beatrice couldn't guide him anymore because Beatrice was reason and mind. And Beatrice had to say, I can't take you any further. Now it's you. And that's, the mind can only take us so far, reason can only take us so far, thought can only take us so far, you got to let it all go, and then you'll discover that the heaven you're seeking happens to be right where you're standing. And you'll go, wow. Any questions? Rudy used to talk about death and rebirth. Is he speaking about death of the ego? Death of pieces of ego. Yeah. Every time the ego dies, part of the ego dies, it's a real it's a real loss. It's really painful. That's why trying to shatter the whole thing at once is not for the weak of heart. Piece by piece, the ego falls away. And as it falls away, you will experience death. You will experience this awful, awful feeling of abandonment, of aloneness, of suffering, of what's wrong. I mean, it's dark. It's a dark space. Being cut off from what you identify as you, even a piece, a big piece of you. And Rudy would say, the way this works is very natural. It's like leaves falling off a tree at the end of the season. You know, they're barren. They're barren. There's no beauty. There's no anything. It's such a sad place. And those people who drive in, who live in the East Coast where you actually see seasons, see the loss of and the barrenness of the woods. And then spring comes. And it's like rebirth is, one, you, the leaves come back, but they, the branches are bigger. There are more leaves. There's more of you than there was before. The incredible thing about death and rebirth is it brings you into a greater space than you inhabited at the time in the last season. And, and Rudy, I used to describe this, he used to prune us. Part of the class was a pruning. And you would feel, you know, oh my God, why am I coming to this class? You know, I mean, Rudy would often kind of beat us up. You know, he would just say, what's wrong with you? I mean, he would be really cutting. But pieces of you would fall off right in the room, you know. And it was like devastating. And then you would take weeks to kind of come back. But when you came back, it was like a rose bush that had been professionally pruned. You just came back like more beautiful than you can ever imagine. That's a, that's a job of a really good teacher. You know, and uh, I don't operate quite like Rudy does. I just get out of the way and let the universe play its, what it's doing. It does it, does it quite brilliantly. But, it, but it's the same process. We do, f we do die over and over and over if you're willing to. And then you come back. And it appears to be that's the cycle that goes on forever. I don't know that for a fact, but, you know, sun goes down, sun comes up. Sun goes down, sun comes up. Breath goes out, breath, breath comes back. Breath goes out, breath comes back. This, this appears to be the nature of the universe. It's, it appears to be breathing. On some level, we appear, disappear, appear, disappear. I don't know that that goes on forever, but it sure feels like the natural system that we are in. So if you die, Rudy said, basically, when you're going through a death, you'll, you'll feel miserable. He said, get yourself a Hershey bar or a chocolate uh, <laughs> s sundae or something, you know, and, and just ride it out. Treat yourself nicely, and then you'll come back. But don't use your death as an excuse to beat up other people and get angry at other people and express your tensions and hostilities, which people often do. Use your death to be quiet and still, reflective, and let life return when it wants to. It will. So, instead of fighting the negative of the negative and trying to get rid of the, the negative ego, isn't it perhaps an easier path to do what Abraham Heschel talks about and try to embrace that, that concept or theory of radical amazement and look at the positive beyond all of that? There's so many teachings. And I, and I can only say, yes, <laughs> yes. I don't know if it's easier or better. I don't, I, I, it's not the one I do. I do what I'm just talking about, and it functions for me, and for some reason people have gathered here to hear it. If you find a teaching that works for you, or if you find within yourself the teaching that works for you, God bless, that's the one you should follow. I'm not trying to make people disciples of me or Rudy or a practice at all. I would rather not 
have to say any of this stuff. I'd rather like to just sit and tap you on the forehead and go, you're done. You know, that would be so wonderful. But it doesn't work that way. And you know, a lot of you have been coming and coming and coming and I haven't found the avenue and I, and I have no clue what I need to do other than show up on a regular basis and say pretty much the same thing over and over. There are so many teachers out there that are so brilliant and whose teaching is really right. Radical, what was it called? Radical acceptance? Radical amazement. Ama radical amazement. I mean, that's what you teach. That's what this experience is. I think so. I think so. I, put to the, I, I like that term. You know? I, I, I can only tell you that in my best moments, at, in which come pretty regularly, I walk around going, I cannot get over what is going on. Now, I gave a class, I think, last... Last week I was in Big Indian in New York and I gave us three talks and they're pretty much trying to get at what it's like to be aware of the universe around you, not through the filter of your mind judging it, but just through the fact that it's there and you're looking at it. I mean, that, the ultimate teaching is the thing you're looking for is in front of you. There's nowhere else. Where else could it be? And yet most people are looking at it, and I, as I say in that talk in Big Indian, and all they're going is, What's wrong with, why can't I get a connection to my internet? <laughs> like, that, like that's the whole, the whole thing. It's like their whole life, they're, they're, all of this is happening, and the one thing that's not happening is all they're thinking about. That's not how it should work. Or should is the wrong word, because that is how it works. Mm -hmm. But to learn to move beyond that is extraordinary. And to be able to take a breath when the internet's not working and say, okay, <laughs> that's a big achievement. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. You know, I mean, there was a funny guy, there was a guy, I heard this a while back on an airplane who was very upset that the internet on the airplane wasn't working and somebody said, do you understand that you're in a piece of metal flying through the sky at 500 miles an hour? What, what, are you, what, are you, what is this thing about the internet not working? You know, the, the people don't get, they don't get the amazement of what is happening right as we speak. And that's, I, all I want to do is help people wake up to that. <clears throat> And I don't have any mechanism for doing it other than sharing this journey. And every so often, because the energy in the room becomes very alive and present, you tap into it and you go, that's what it feels like. For five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, whatever it is you're able to do, you go, oh, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's worth it. And because you don't get it from the movies, you don't get it from television, you don't get it from the radio necessarily, you don't get it on the freeway, you don't get it talking to your best friends, you get it making love sometimes, you know, but mostly you don't get it. You don't get it. And even if you do it get, making love sometime, you can't make love 24 hours 7, some people try, but <laughs> then it won't, then it won't, it, it will cease to deliver. So it's like, what can you do? Sit down, sit still, you know, I say stop, sit, stay. That's the teaching. Okay. Oops. Um, I remember one time we talked about, about the apple falling from the tree. It's just like eventually that's just what it does, you know? Yeah. That's sort of the result of spiritual Exactly. Practice. Rudy yeah. called it, when the fruit is ripe, it's done. Oh, okay. It falls from the tree. Yeah. You know, it's, really, it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, we... <laughs> We, we found, we had a tree in our front yard in, in San Rafael that had these little yellow things growing on it. And we didn't know what they were. And, and I kept thinking, don't eat that. Don't touch the, to, to the kids who always want to grab and eat anything that's colorful. And I said, don't eat that. But we kept watching it. It kept getting a little bigger and a little bigger. And suddenly we realized these are apricots. And I, we, we didn't know we had an apricot tree because this year we had rain and it, I guess it produced enough uh, moisture to create the apricot. And... We t I took one bite of this apricot, and I just about passed out. I mean, it, it was so delicious, and it was mine. It was, it was just growing in profusion. And then the kids, we all went out and were grabbing apricots and eating apricots and getting pails and filling them with apricots, and we still couldn't get enough of them. And I just looked at it, and I said, this is what life is. And, and a lot of them are going to fall on the ground and maybe grow more trees. Birds are going to eat the ones on the top, because even with a ladder, I couldn't get to the ones on top. And it was like, what a gift. It's a gift. And... and, and and it just keeps giving in its own way. And it gives in its season, you know, we all know that. The apricots are not going to be there in the middle of the winter. They're there when they're supposed to be there. And everything works that way. And, and our inability to see it, our, my, my fear of what those were, that they were going to be poisonous, you know. <laughs> you know, you, you give it enough time and it shows you what it is. That's all it is. It's really wonderful. And we are all fruit ready to, 
when we get ready to drop off the tree. I was sitting with that and, and working with that, and something even I got even something more out of it, which is the apple tree doesn't wake up one morning and decide, you know what? I think I'll produce some apples. You know, it's just what it it's it's its nature to produce apples. Absolutely. And so I'm sort of going through the experience of experiencing myself and all of us. Is it's our nature to just produce this consciousness that you know, you're teaching us. We it's, are it's, it. It's our natural process. It's, to do it. We're doing it all the time. We're just totally unaware of it. It's like you know those fish that swim through the water, saying, "What do you? What is this thing called water?" You know, they're right there. It's just so available they don't see it. What is this air that we're breathing? You know, we don't know it. We don't know what we are because we're so it. That's the, that's the magic of this. The realization is you've always been it. It's not new. It's not like, oh my God, I've arrived there because I've done good work or I've practiced all these years. You arrive there because you suddenly realize, oh, I've always been there. Oh. And you feel kind of stupid on some level because what, what is it to wake up to the thing that's always been? On the other hand, the gratitude is incredible because you can also live this whole life and never see what you've been. That's hard. Anyone else? People looking at their watches? Yeah. Let me, let me bring up something quickly just so I can figure it out. Blanche and I, have, all of our classes everywhere else are taught at 11 rather than 10. And now that we're getting old, getting up earlier is harder. How many people would, would, be, would still come, I don't know how to put this, if we taught the class at 11 instead of 10? And, and how many people would find it hard? Are there people who would find it hard? Yeah, yeah you have kids. I know, that's the problem. You too. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally get it. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let, let me. I just want to say one thing. If you do change it to eleven when you're here, I would like it if we could keep it at ten for the other week. Gotcha. Because gotcha. I think it's easier okay. for people. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll think about this. I mean, you know, <laughs> we really are getting old, <laughs> and. Uh, so if you, st if you stay up at a to a certain point at night, you just the next morning is like, oh my god. But anyway, it's all it's all we'll figure it out. I think probably we'll keep it the same. Um, Blanche, was there anything else that I needed to say? I can't. I think that was it, right? We have to leave. Oh yes, today we have to leave by two o'clock today. So anyone who wants to hang out beforehand is welcome to. But at two, we're going to leave. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.